Gideon. Is that better? It's teaching us a lot of lessons about how God chooses and uses people. People that are unsuspecting and people that are in, in the eyes of human estimation and judgment. Uh, unqualified and unworthy to do the work of God. The title of our message today is Gideon and the work of the Spirit of God, the assurance of his victory. And I want you to really take those words in, the work of the Spirit of God and the assurance of victory. This is what the narrative will be teaching us in terms of a central point. But there are many applications I hope that the Spirit of God would draw out for your life. How does the Spirit of God work in bringing about the assurance of victory in the life of the people of God. Consider, consider with me the danger, the holy danger, the gloriously holy danger of being concerned for the things of God in a place of solitude, insignificance, and obscurity. It's a starting point. I, I describe it as a holy danger the gloriously holy danger of being concerned for the things of God and being concerned for the things of God in a place of obscurity and insignificance and solitude. And of course, what I am talking about is how we met the man Gideon. We met him in a place of deep, deep contemplation about the things of God. That's the man that you met. You met a man resonating with the difficulties of his own time and resonating with the difficulties of his own life. You met a man who was clearly agitated by the events that circumscribed his life. But you also met a man who was very much aware of his own inadequacies, his own deficiencies, his own inability to change the circumstances that are around him. Now, the effort of my labors are around how important it is to think right. We meet Gideon at the point of thinking, at the point of reasoning through, at the point of concern for his situation, for his life. Is that not an inference of some kind of discernment? Of course it is. It's an inference of Gideon at least being aware that things are wrong. The matters about my life are not right. And Gideon is concerned about it. See, it all starts with the way we think. And God took notice of the meditation and cogitation and deep agitation and concern of Gideon, did he not? Did he not meet Gideon in the contemplative state of trying to figure out where is the Lord? What is the Lord up to? If he's up to anything, why has all this fallen out to our people? And if you guys remember, maybe I need to stir you up by way of remembrance, your pure minds. God met Gideon in this deep cogitation first with the word of the living God by the prophet who came and let Gideon, as well as everybody know, that the whole people of God were out of line with God. Remember that. And the second thing that God did was not only bring the word of God, but he also now brought the revelation of Christ. Gideon is now being interceded now, in, invaded by the presence of God because the angel of the Lord shows up in the middle of Gideon's thoughts. And what does the Lord say to him? Gideon. Gideon, the Lord is with you, thou mighty man of valor. I want you to grasp the idea that in order for you and I to come into a place where we comprehend and therefore find ourselves in the company of the true and the living God is at the level of how we think. It's how we think. And marvel at this because you have been on this excursion with me. God met him in his thoughts. And then God told him what God's thoughts were. And now Gideon is re uh, uh, resonating with the revelation of God's thoughts. And God is giving Gideon promises that God would deliver Israel 
through God himself. So Gideon's thoughts and God's thoughts are now integrating, are they not? And God is bringing Gideon into a place of assurance. This is, this is what we might call the prevenient work of grace, that, that preparatory work of grace, where God deals with you in your heart and your mind, where God lets you know something's wrong with the world and something's wrong with you. And something's wrong with me. What you're going to learn through the through line of our study all the way to the end of our excursion is that God lifts Gideon up to show you and I that Gideon had a right assessment of himself. Like God will not use you mightily until you understand who you are and who you are in God. Like that, that is essential to the blessing of the spirit of God. So you might lift up the reality that when the spirit of God begins to deal with you, he's dealing with you, bringing you into a revelation of you, a proper understanding of yourself. How can you do what God wants you to do until you understand who you are in light of God's view of you? And many people would take Gideon and view Gideon as a kind of weakling and a kind of foibler of faith, a kind of individual who is demonstrating over and over again almost an irreverence towards God as we have it here in our account. But may I say this, Gideon knows his limitations. Gideon knows his weaknesses. Gideon knows his deficiencies. And God is drawing that out to teach you and me some lessons about the only way you're going to get God on your side is for you to get on God's side about who you are and the reality of all that you are before him. And imagine this, Gideon being hungry for the truth, laboring mentally. Remember what I told you, the treading of the corn was a kind of mental exercise of discerning between truth and error and falsehood and righteousness. When the wheat is separated from the chaff, we clearly see what is now eatable and digestible and ripe for us over against that which is chaff, do we not? And we get to see by discernment when God graces us what is true and what is false. And all believers are made to know the truth as it is in Christ because we can have no assurance until we have separated the wheat from the chaff. And that labor has blessed Gideon with not only the codified word of God, not only the presence of Christ, not only the promises of God, but he also blessed Gideon with the power to actually break down his daddy's idols. And we talked about that last week, did we not? How that is extremely important that if we're going to be any, do any largest work for God, home has to be taken care of first. Right. If a man does not know how to take care of his own household, he has no ability, no capacity, no calling to deal with the larger straits and difficulties of society. And Gideon is, is, is modeling for us how God brings us along in preparation for the task to which God has called us. Now, think about this, because we're almost at the point of deeper consideration. Gideon has thought his way through the problem. And he's finding himself now in the middle of a holy war for God with the bullseye on his back. And he's God's man now. Do you see how far he has come? Gideon now finds himself in the middle of God's battle as God's man in God's hour, in God's moment. How far has a brother come for simply being graced to think right before God? Hence, again, the title of our message, Gideon and the work of the Spirit and the assurance of victory. Gideon has exhibited the power of God in his life and the humiliation of Baal in his family's life and the exaltation of not only of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of God's grace in the offering of that sacrifice, but the exaltation of Gideon himself. Gideon is now exalted, is he not? Look with me again in our text over at verse 32, 6 verse 32. This is where we pick up with Gideon. Therefore, on that day, he, that is Gideon's father, called him Jerubbaal, saying, let Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his altar. We picked up last time in recognizing that Gideon is exalted, is he not? 
Gideon has now been put on a platform to be seen by all of his brethren as the men that God used to restore Israel to the true and living God. Anybody with me? This is no small matter. When you live in a world of error and falsehood, when you live in a community where your loved ones are buying into Baal or everywhere, and God is pleased to use you to tear down that idol and reestablish the crown rights of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that's no small matter. You need to be going, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, because that's what God has called you and me to do. I closed out last time. We are called to bring down every imagination and every reasoning and every doctrine and every falsehood that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Why, pastor? Without that labor, no one will be saved. Everybody's walking around with a refuge in front of them, hiding them from the reality of the truth. We live in a culture where this is prominent and totally acceptable. And what has God done? He's made Gideon the man of the hour. He's made Gideon the man of the hour. But do you know what happens when you find yourself in the holy war of God? And as one of the chief uh, proponents of a battle for the glory of God and for the fame of Christ, do you know what happens? Now you have a bullseye on your back. Look at the text, verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Do you see it? So now you see how that what's being juxtaposed is how God is moving in the life of his people, raising up a savior motif. You guys do understand the theme I told you last week, and I want you to hold on to it because you will not be able to see the progression of the gospel in our preaching if you don't hold these major themes. God always uses one man to save many. That is the low I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will. Gideon, therefore, is a great type of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. There's one savior, one mediator between God and man. And what is his name? The Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever God is going to save, and I may say this also, whenever he's going to redeem his people, because I heard Angelo, uh, Elder Angelo asserting in, in our prayer, you know, Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you, please bring them into a saving knowledge of Christ that they might know him and the power and pardon of their sins. I said in my own breath behind him, Lord, if there's anyone in here that knows you, but living in rebellion and disobedience against you, break their heart and bring them back to the fold, oh God. That's what I'm saying. Because, of course, the narrative is teaching us restoration after repentance. Wasn't that last week's message? When God grants repentance unto the acknowledgement of the truth, you will begin to see restoration. And then that was inferred in our elders' words when he said, Lord, we need a what? A revival in our land. Don't you feel it? Don't you sense it? Isn't it logical to men and women who, who think transcendently, who know that the world is not just a bunch of molecules bumping into each other unintelligibly, but that God has created this universe for his own glory? And that when things are falling apart, for it to come back together again, God has to intervene? Why aren't the people of God all over America calling on the name of the Lord? Because that's where the remedy comes from. And I'm here to tell you it started with our brother Gideon. And if you wonder, will God use one person, one man, one woman, one child to change an event, to change an environment, to change a society? The answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. And if a man is hungering for truth, and, and starving for righteousness in the land. Have we not stated it over and over again? God has granted him a hunger. God has granted her a hunger. See, I'm excited about the text because I see once again how that God works to bring to pass his glorious will when he brings his people to a place of understanding who they are. Gideon is about to get a hold of some handles, ladies and gentlemen, some tools, some assets by which God will be highly exalted and the people of God will be redeemed out of captivity. 
and the enemies of God will be summarily defeated. May he grant you grace to understand the truth of the scripture today. We look therefore then at point number one in our outline. I call this the clarion call of the spirit of God. The clarion call of the spirit of God. It can be seen over in verse 34 really simply, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now that expression is used very tersely in the book of Judges. It's not a term used for every judge in the book of Judges. It is a term, however, for those who are sensitive to looking for the person and work of God in the scriptures to highlight. Because what we are discovering is when Gideon discovers that he has a bullseye on his back and that he is called to be what God had promised him in verse 11 and in verse 12 and in verse 14 of our earlier chapter. Gideon, you mighty man of valor, the Lord will deliver Israel out of the hands of the Midianites through you. Boy, that sounds good as a promise to any one of us. Is that right? But then when the implications of that promise emerge and you discover that you are the man or the woman of the hour to have to fight the Lord's battle, it's a whole nother thing when you look up and see the legions of adversaries mounting up a resistance against you. Now what you gonna do? Well, may I tell you as we continue to move on, it's not so much as what you are going to do, it's what is God going to do? And here I am telling you that the way God works is that when it's time to prepare you for battles, he is going to give you the aid of the third person because it's impossible for you to fight the Lord's battles without the Lord himself. Please capture this first point. The clarion call of the spirit of God is given to Gideon so Gideon can be the one man that we were told he would be, right? As one man, as one man to do things beyond Gideon's own inability to do. The clarion trumpet means that Gideon now has a voice. Hear me now. He has a voice that will work in a powerful way to gather together the elect of God, the people of God, and prepare them for the battle that is in front of them. That is the work of the Spirit of God in the first sense. And do we not see an illusion of this in the idea of the gospel? Is not the gospel a trumpet? Is it not a clarion call? You better know that it is. The gospel is a trumpet call to sinners that they are under the wrath of God. It is a trumpet call to repentant sinners that the only way of escape from that wrath is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you are truly a child of God, when the spirit of God speaks to you, he speaks to you as a trumpet. Did not John, the beloved apostle, say that in Revelation chapter 1? And I heard behind me a voice like unto a trumpet. And being turned by the grace of God, I saw the voice that spake with me. I'll say it as I said it many years ago as we worked this through. You ready for this? The unbeliever never hears a trumpet when God's word is spoken. The true believer knows that God's voice is power. And it's a call to respond to him in reverence and holiness. Numbers chapter 10 becomes what we call the catechism for this paradigm. Numbers chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 to give you an idea of how the Old Testament, as Israel was making its way through the wilderness, were taught that whenever God is calling attention to you, he's going to use a trumpet to blow. And here's what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shall you make them. That is, the trumpet shall not be put together in component parts. It shall be one whole silver part. That is a fascinating concept in itself. That you may use them for the what? Calling of the assembly. You see, ladies and gentlemen, how that the gospel is an integrating principle? Do you see how the gospel calls us together? Do you understand that church, ecclesia, or synagogue is a gathering together of the people of God? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And is not under most circumstances when you and I are out of the way, we're like sheep scattered upon the mountains? Does not God have to call you back to himself? 
And is he not doing that every time we gather in the preaching and teaching of the word of God when it comes in power? Does he not assemble us? Is that not our theme? In Psalm 119, remember the word unto thy servant upon which you have caused us to hope. This is our comfort in all of our affliction because your word is what gives us life. Ladies and gentlemen, you were saved by a call. You were called out of darkness. You were called out of death. You were called out of deafness. And it wasn't a whistle. It wasn't a flute. I'm sorry. It was a trumpet. And it shook your soul up out of the grave of sin and aroused you to a revelation of his, his righteousness and the horror of your rebellion and your hell-bound state. And it gave you enough life to say, Lord, save me. And he brought your soul up out of that grave of sin and death. The blessed trumpet call of the gospel. This is what Joe, this is what Gideon has found himself engaged in, conflating the work of the spirit with the trumpet. Notice what it says in verse one here. It says that you may call the, the assembly and for the journeying of the camp. So there are two things here I want you to capture. Won't stay long, but the symbolism is unavoidable because talking about the spirit of God and the trumpet, it's unavoidable because you and I are not deeply rooted covenant people. We don't know our Bibles well enough to just hear terms expressed in the narrative and understand their backdrop, okay? So we have to do this because we just don't live in a culture where people are that deep in the word of God. So notice what it says. They are assembled together and they are assembled together for their what? Journey. In other words, God has called the people of God to advance in their walk with him and to move forward because we have a destiny to arrive at. Is that not true? It can be stated again every time the preaching of the gospel is set forth and the, and the word of God is soundly expounded. Not only are we assembled, we are advancing forward, pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Is that true? Are we on a journey? Right. So I need you to know two things. The enemy hates the assembly. It hates the assembly. We've known that now for two and a half years. It hates the reassembly because every time we reassemble, we're given instructions how we might advance in our walk in God. And every time we advance in our walk of God, we are demonstrating the defeat of the enemy and the soon annihilation of him at the arriving of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Am I making some sense? Very important for you to comprehend. Verse 3. Let me keep going. Verse 3. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to meet thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. We can press down right there and talk about what is it that keeps a child of God when they hear the call to worship to not come? What is it that when a child of God hears the call, the call to Coram Dale, and they don't come? What an awesome proposition. I've said it to you before. I'm almost, I'm almost done with my assignment. I don't know how many more Sundays I have to do. But I'm so glad from day one that God called me, that when he taught me that he's calling us to gather in the preaching and the worship and exaltation of himself, I have never yet found anything better to do than worship the true and the living God with the people of God. I haven't been able to say, Lord, you know, I heard you, but I got something else to do because it's a trumpet call. It's not a whistle. And it's certainly not a dog whistle because all across the land, we have taught our world that God brings his people together publicly and visibly as a warning that one day he will separate his elect from this world and the world be, will be left to darkness and judgment. And this is what we're getting symbolically out of what's taking place with Gideon. Maybe a few more verses. Verse 4. Notice what it goes on to say. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of thousands of Israel, shall gather them, themselves together. This is the leadership coming in preparation of hearing from God so they might know how to lead the people. You guys got that? Notice the next verse. And when you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east parts shall go forward. Now it's going to talk about the four uh, quaternium of the tribes, three in each quarter. Now they're gathering together in preparation for war 
And child of God, we have been learning for years that worship and warfare are the two tandem principles going on in the life of the people of God. So it might be stated every time you come to church, you are coming to worship, but you're also coming to be fitted for war. And so we are there now in our text. Go back to our Gideon text. I want to make my way through. There are a number of things here that need to be um, ascertained and understood. And the point number one, the clarion call of the Spirit of God is very clear. Uh, Amos put it like this. Shall the trumpet be blown and the people not be warned? And then we read under our first point, two sub points that I want to quickly affirm the commitment of his brethren. Will you please look at verse 34a and notice the efficacy of the blowing of the trumpet. What did it do? It actually gathered his brethren, did it not? Look at verse 34, verse 34, uh, I'm sorry, verse 34 uh, C. So 34a, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, 34b, and he blew a trumpet. 34C, and Abiezer was what? Gathered after him. Do you guys see that? See, now think about this. Again, I don't want to sit here too long, but I love this. Abiezer was a group of men just a few minutes ago that wanted to kill his brother. Do y'all remember that? And now the Spirit of God is working in their life because they see that he is exalted to be the leader and now he has a way in their heart and they are the first ones to come. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I am saying when Jesus Christ came unto his own, just like Gideon, they rejected him until Jesus rose again from the dead. And when his voice became a trumpet because of his triumphant resurrection, the first to gather to Jesus are the redeemed Jewish people. That is the application going on here. That is the application. And we were to draw out the inference, it would be clear. If you and I are in our unregenerate state, we would continue to have antipathy and hatred for God's word, and we would never come to Christ. But once you are born again and Christ calls you, you are glad to come to him. And no one can come unto me except my father which sent me draw him. Here's what we call the integrating principle. I'm here to tell you that God is gathering all things unto Christ in heaven and in earth and under the earth so that all things might be brought under the foot of the Father through the Son by the church one day. So even today, you and I are actually acting out this emblem, are we not? In our soul, we heard the call to worship. In our soul, we long to be in the presence of God. In our soul, we're ready to be taught, corrected, admonished, and transformed by the word of the living God. In our soul, we know we've been knitted together in God in Christ. In our soul, we know we've been begotten of the spirit of the living God. In our soul, we know we were made to worship God. That's why we are here. And they gathered after him. I love the text. This is Mark's gospel. One illustration of it. Chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. You can see this easily. When Jesus began his ministry, what did he do? He began to call men to himself. Did he not? He began to call men to himself. That was a trumpet call. He was, he was quietly gathering together his elect. First his 12. And then the broader group of the people. Were they not coming to him? Of course they were. Listen, and he goeth up into a high mountain and does what? Calleth unto him whom he would. Do you see that? Now watch this last line. And they came unto him. That's how a sinner is saved. By the king sitting on the mountain of his kingdom and authoritatively calling you by the gospel and you come. Now I'm going to tell you this created a mess. Just like what Gideon did created a mess. Look at verse 14. Mark 3, 14. Watch this. And he ordained 12 that they should be with him that he might what? Send them forth to preach. Do you not see that in our Gideon text? That's going to be clear in verse 35. Gideon is about to send out messengers all throughout the northern part of Israel to draw the men who are to come to war for him. We see that going on here in our text. Verse 15. Mark 3 15 and to have power to heal the sick and to cast out devils is that power for or what look over at verse 21 now if you're shouting about the whole matter of evangelism and preaching know this you're going to have adversaries when you do it right for God 
Look at verse 21. Here it is. And when his friends heard of it, heard of what? Jesus going to a high mountain, doing what? Calling men to himself, doing what? Preparing them to do what? Preach the gospel. Watch what they said. They said, when uh, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he done lost his mind. Do you see it? Right, and, and this is why we see Gideon as a great type of Christ, because he had obstacles in his own family. How dare you, son of Mary, son of Joseph, act like you are Messiah? Well, the reason why he acted like it is because he was. And you and I have to understand whenever we are complying with and comporting with God's will, we're going to have opposition and largely it's going to start at home. Look again over not only at verse 21, but look at verse 22. Look at verse 22, Mark 3, 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, he hath what? And by the prince of devils, he casts out devil. Do you see the opposition? Do you see the opposition here in the gospel corresponding to where we are back in the Gideon text? Go back there. I want you to see it as we close out point number one. Look at Judges 6, verse 33 again. I want you to see this. You need to look at it. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together. Now, we saw them in the opening of our chapter. Remember what God said? They were like the sands of the sea for number. They were like locusts everywhere. This was a massive group of opposition to Gideon. Y'all got that? All because Gideon was doing the exploits that God gave him grace to do in his own local community. This is a framework for you, ladies and gentlemen, to help you understand that the matters of the gospel are not indifferent to the world. The world does not care for God. The world does not care for God's truth. The world will oppose you even to your death. Given the right circumstances and the right power, you must know this. Therefore, when God calls you to himself, you're on God's team and you're called to fight God's war. This is what's going on with Gideon. I just wanted to frame it for you. I just wanted to frame it. And again, as we close out on this point, what does God do when he calls a man or a woman or a people group to be a living witness for his glory? He has to give them the power to be his witnesses. And that's what point number one is underscoring uh, uh, in verse 34 of our text. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now, when the spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon, it's important for you to know this. It's not coming upon Gideon in some kind of ethereal, mystical, sort of new agey way. When the spirit of God comes upon Gideon, it's in order to give Gideon the gift of power and wisdom to execute his mission. I'm going to say it again for people that are really concerned about why did God save me, leave me in this world to do his will. God saved you by his power and he gives you his spirit to grant you wisdom so that you might know who you are in him and that you might discover your gifts and abilities in order to do his will. You're going to see that here in the text. Gideon is going to be gifted to organize. Gideon is going to be gifted to strategize. Gideon is going to be gifted to position himself and prepare the people of God and to engage a battle that he will be successful in. Ladies and gentlemen, that's called wisdom. I'm going to say it one more time. The Spirit of God is given to you not so you can do backflips and, and walk on air and hover and, and, and speak in unintelligible speech. It's in order that you might know God, understand his wisdom, and be able to walk in a way that advances God's glory in your life, that you might successfully fight a good warfare. Am I making some sense to you? Right. This, the things of God are not mutually exclusive to ideas like being uh, sound in your mind, being clear in your judgments, being studious in your calling being committed to the patience that's required to develop you and mature you, given the gift of discernment so you can know what's right from wrong, given the ability to prioritize your life in such a way that you can actually make choices, I say it all the time, that will advance you in your walk with God, it will bring a witness to others around you and ultimately bring men and women to know that God is with you. 
Why on earth would Gideon be filled with the spirit of God to just kind of run around in circles and navel gaze at himself? He's just called a ton of men to him, has he not? He's just called a ton of men. By way, 32,000 came. Do you hear me? 32,000 men came by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, if they come, are they coming to sit around and watch the man close his, uh, uh, cross his legs and get in a lotus position and just hover up and down in the sky? Or, or are they coming for instruction? Are they coming for wisdom? Are they coming for understanding? Are they not coming? And this is what our next point is going to be about. Are they not coming to understand that the Lord is with Gideon? And that the Lord has prepared a stratagem for delivering the people of God. Can you imagine? You guys got time for me. You got time? Can you imagine Israel not hearing that shofar horn since the days they were in the wilderness? Can you imagine that? They're in the promised land and they don't even remember. Uh, because it never had been blown because Israel was so much in disarray and caught up in so much carnality and given to so much fleshliness and because there wasn't a leading person to blow the trumpet and call them together that they might be taught the right ways of the Lord that they might overcome their enemies in their own land and in territory and in their inheritance they never heard the trumpet and now Gideon is blowing it. And you know what's happening to God's elect among them? They're saying, we remember what our mama and our daddy told us. That when it's time to come together, we would hear a trumpet blow. And the men rose up from four, five tribes and gathered together under Gideon. I'm here to tell you there is another evidence of the work of the spirit of God in that act are you hearing me a an assembly of true believers mature, saints who are being called vitally to the work of God has to be called by God's spirit are you hearing me right this is a work of God and Gideon is a man for the moment and all he did was blow the trumpet but God is supplying Gideon with grace in order to strategically put together a team and this is where you and I are getting ready to deal with the principle again, separation. Are you ready for it? It's the doctrine of separation. Remember I told you that's what Gideon was doing when he was separating the wheat from the child. That's what Gideon was doing when he was separating his father's idol from the people of God. Now Gideon is getting ready to go back into the exercise of separation again. Our second point is going to teach us the doctrine of separation under three categories. Are you ready? The first category of separation is going to be the category of sanctification, how that God sanctifies and sets apart that which is holy from that which is unholy. The second thing that we're going to see in this, that God does it sovereignly. God sovereignly separates that which is acceptable to him and that which is not. We're going to see that in this sign request that Gideon is granting. And then thirdly, what we're going to see inherent in this sign request is salvation. Three things are going to be inherent in this, in this what might be to you this kind of strange, bizarre request. I'm going to explain it to you here more fully here in a moment. But notice what happens, what Gideon does. This is what I thought was so absolutely wonderful about Gideon. We discover over in verse 35 that Gideon sends messengers throughout all Manasseh who also was gathered after him. And then he sent messengers to Asher and to Zebulon and to Naphtali, five. And then what happens? And they all came to meet him. Is that not the allusion to Mark 3? Jesus gathering together sheep from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Are you guys seeing the integration principle? All right, so then we land right there because Gideon is sensitive to a number of things. And I want to circle back on this, this sensitivity. He's sensitive to what God is doing. And now he's sensitive to the enormity of the mission. He's sensitive to it. So something is about to happen that's going to give you and me some great insights into my dear brother. And remember the title of our message, the work of the spirit of God and bringing about the assurance of victory. 
Anybody with me? So Gideon is aware that these men wouldn't even favor him if it wasn't for the grace of God. Gideon is aware that when he sends out messengers, these are ambassadors. Are they not types of gospel preachers? Are we not ambassadors of Christ? Are we not to call the brother into God? And if they come, we know who did it, don't we? Gideon is aware that God is working. When the believer is aware that God is working, what the believer does not do is get proud of the fact that God is working through him. There are some lessons to learn now. This is why I want you to get Gideon right. Don't get him wrong. This is so interesting, too, because, you know, when you're studying people, you're analyzing people for whatever reason you may be doing it. If you get that person wrong, that means you don't understand them. Are you ready? If you don't understand them, in all likelihood, you're going to get them wrong. If you don't understand them, you're not going to get their motive. You're not going to get their intent. And if you don't get a person's motive and intent, you may ascribe unto them false notions about why they do what they do. That's what they did with Jesus. Remember, he works by the power of Beelzebub. How asinine is that pejorative against our master? He never sinned, did he? He never did anything wrong. He never, never had an evil thought. He never injured anyone, right? A bruised reed will he not quench. A spoken flax would he not put out. Jesus never had an ill thought. And yet everybody wants to condemn him as not only demonic, but didn't we learn his family say, he crazy? That's because they did not understand who he was. So my admonishment to you right now as we go deeper into our text is I want you to understand how important it is, as I shared with our ladies in the WTC, how important it is to know yourself. How important it is to know yourself. God might work with you today to accomplish a task, and you might discover that that task was done well. But if you don't understand that God gave you the grace to do it, in spite and then resource you to do it, you might inadvertently, unwittingly steal God's glory. And then tomorrow when the next task comes along, rather than recognizing that what happened yesterday was yesterday, and I don't get to presume upon today because of what happened yesterday, I'm not going to say to myself, because God gave me the ability to win the battle yesterday, I'm automatically going to win the battle today. At that point, I have actually made a fool to myself. I have asserted to myself qualities and gifts that I have not been able to justify. This is the fallacy of fools who don't know themselves. And we need to be very careful of that in our own right, should we not? And what I'm about to teach you now is how that Gideon knew his own what? Weaknesses. He knew his own limitations. And when the Spirit of God is working with you, the Spirit of God is not going to cultivate in you a pride of self. And Christians are often guilty of it. When the Spirit of God is working in you, he's not going to work in you a pride of self. The Spirit of God is not going to work in you the ability to boast in, look at what God did with me through my father's family. Look at how God is with me. Look at how God is working through me. Gideon said nothing of the sort. Are y'all hearing me? Gideon isn't even telling men and women how weak he is. Bring it home, pastor, bring it home. Because we can actually boast in our infirmities in ways that still point to ourselves. Am I making some sense? Gideon is not boasting to everybody about how sinful he is, how weak he is, how flawed he is. That is a kind of pietism that bothers me, even among our community. Why? Because it's not pointing to Christ. It's kind of a subordinate mode of self-centeredness. Am I making some sense? I'm sure you're weak. <laughs> you don't have to tell me you're weak. I know you're weak. Like I tell you, don't tell people you're saved. I've told you that before. What's the point in telling somebody you're saved when you're getting ready to fall and then get them all jacked up in your head about you telling them you're saved? 
They got to wrestle now with the credibility of your uh, uh, verbose expression of your saved state. Don't tell them you're saved. Let God tell them you're saved. See, Gideon does not have to tell any of these guys he's weak. What God is about to do is demonstrate that Gideon is strong through his weakness. Are y'all hearing me? Through his weakness. Point number two then, let's go to work. I got a little time and I'm going to make sure that we understand point number two in our outline is so very clear. The certainty of Gideon's success symbolized. Now this is powerful. There's a lot of work to be done here. I'm going to try to streamline it, but there's a lot going on. Verse 36, will you look at verse 36? And Gideon said unto who? And Gideon said unto who? That means Gideon is not talking to anyone. He's may I help you when the spirit of God is working in your life he will compel you to find your answers ultimately in God but when the spirit of God is working in your life as we learned in John 16 13 he will convince you of your sin and once he convinces you of your sin he will convince you that ultimately God is the one with the answer is that true It will therefore be clear to those of us who understand that the compelling work of the Spirit of God is to drive every successful man or woman of God. Every child of God will only be successful to the degree that you commune with the Father through the Son by the Spirit in prayer. See what I mean by the work of the Spirit of God now? Do you see what I mean by the work of the Spirit of God now? Do you see how the Spirit of God is not only exalting Jerubbaal or Gideon, but he's also humbling him at the same time. Right, see what Gideon knows is that victory that he had with his daddy's house, he could wipe his head and say, woo, I just got through that one. And it was only by the grace of God that I did. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And then soon as he breathes in a breath of, of, of fresh air, he's looking up and thousands Tens of thousands of God's enemies got him as the bullseye on his back. Gideon immediately senses the work of the Spirit of God, pressing on Gideon the reality, the visceral reality that Gideon cannot find any consolation of capacity to deal with this assignment on his own. And the first thing that he does is he calls on God. He's got 32,000 men. You know I know the text, right? 32,000 men that are standing looking at him. They've been given an assignment to go to battle against 600,000 enemies. See, the odds demand that everybody that has been enlisted in the army of God walk by what? That's what the odds demand. And so Gideon realizes that he's got 32,000 men who haven't ever fought this kind of battle before. And they're all looking to Gideon. And Gideon does not have the answer in himself. Not only does Gideon not have the answer in himself, he does not even remotely believe that he can automatically win this battle without an assurance from God. And so before he goes any further with these men, he prostrates himself before his God and before his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he raises the question again, with a conditional request that's going to teach us more things about how the Spirit of God works. Look at what he does. And Gideon said unto God, If you will save Israel by my hand. Do you see what that is? Right. So again, us proud Christians in the 21st century, living in air-conditioned spaces, crying over a hangnail, would, would indict Gideon for being weak in faith and not trusting the Lord. I mean, you've heard it for decades. God said it. I believe it. That sells it. 
Right, but let me follow you home and see if that's true. You see how hypocritical we are? Do you see how hypocritical we are? Scoot over, Gideon. You are teaching me something, and I want to learn from you, Gideon, how to keep it real with God. So first of all, I'm going to defend Gideon. Gideon is not giving this conditional clause on the grounds of him questioning whether or not God can do it. Gideon is giving this conditional clause on two premises. One is Gideon has no confidence that God will do it through him. Does anybody understand that contradiction, that paradoxical tension, that, that, that struggle? God can do it, absolutely. But can he do it through me? I, I, don't, I don't find any evidence that is so. So what is Gideon going to do? I want you to get this. This is called an imperative. Gideon is going to do what a lot of us don't do when we face a trial where our inadequacy shows up and we're too proud to admit it, Gideon is going to obey the imperative that God gives to all his people. Whenever you are in trouble, call upon me. I will deliver you and you will glorify my name. You have not because you ask not. That is an imperative. The conditions upon which God will always work in the life of his people is the humility of faith. Will you hear me? The only way God will work through you is when you submit yourself to him at the acute level of acknowledging that at no time you could ever win any battle in your own mind, in your own heart, in your own family, in your own life, if the Lord should leave you alone. There it is. There it is. We got, our, we got our plumb line straight, don't we? Now we can rightly divide the word of God here, can we not? Now we're not going to condemn Gideon for something that we just are in our own pride not aware of or familiar with. You're not going to find the man or woman who stays close to God in prayer losing many battles. Sorry. You're not going to find the man or woman of God who is constant in prayer, losing many battles. We lose battles because of presumption. We lose battles because of arrogance. We lose battles because of carnality and assumption. We lose battles because we are operating in our own strength. All right, so it's important for us to capture this under point number two, the certainty of Gideon's success symbolized. Now watch what happens. I'm going to take you through a number of uh, a theological and gospel lessons here. May God bless you to see the glory of God in Christ. Here it is. So Gideon says, if you will save me, save Israel by my hand, as you have said, notice what he says, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know. You see what Gideon is seeking? Assurance. Assurance. Is it all right for the child of God to seek assurance? You better know it. In a battle where 32,000 men could lose their lives, they better know that God is with you. And you better know that God is with you, right? All Gideon is doing is seeking assurance. And that's what you and I should be seeking, should we not? All right, so teach you a little bit more. Are you ready? Security in God is different is different than assurance from God. Security in God is different from assurance in God. All of God's elect are secure in God in Christ. It doesn't matter how crazy you are in your head. Your eternal destiny is secure on the immutable counsel of God's word, the post work of Christ's death at Calvary. It's a yes and amen with God the Father through the Son for you if you're in Jesus. Does that make sense? I'm secure in Christ, but I'm not always assured of Christ. That is being simultaneously righteous and sinful at the same time. Living in a world where daily clouds hover over my head and I don't sense the presence of God's favor in my life. And I need him to blow the clouds away so I can see his smiling face. And that's all Gideon is doing. 
Gideon is keeping it real with his God. Teach, Gideon. Teach. He goes on to say in verse 30, uh, 34, then shall I know, 37, then shall I know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. You see how he's repeating it? Because he's holding to the promise for all that was stated verbally, plenary, plenarily, right, in its inspired proposition and promise. He's now needing God to actually bolster his what? Faith in the promise. He's not stating that the promise is not true. He's stating that I'm, I'm having a hard time getting my hand around the promise. See, some people are getting it, some of y'all are not. I'm having a hard time getting my hand around the promise, oh God. My soul is not settled with the promise objectively being something that can comfort me subjectively. And it's all a problem with me. It's all a problem with me, oh God. I know it's not you, it's with me. So in the vernacular of the hood, help a brother. Help a brother. Help a brother. Now here's where you and I are going to learn how the Spirit of God will bring you low before he lifts you up. And when he does it, he's going to teach you something about his chief organizing principle by which he will never leave you nor forsake you because he can't lie, he can't change, and he won't fail. But you and I have to learn that every day of our life. This is what you're getting ready to learn. Here it is, verse 38 in our text says, after Gideon gave that, that, that particular uh, conditional request, notice what it says in verse 38, part B. This is remarkable. Part A, rather. And it was what? And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the grammatical uh, uh, certitude of that, but what Gideon did was take a bunch of wool, and because God honored him by allowing the dew to descend only on the wool. When Gideon gathers all that wool together and squeezes it, it is a massive amount of water that comes out of the wool. Are you hearing me? Gideon realizes that God has answered his prayer. Gideon realizes that God's still with him. Gideon realizes that God listens to his people when they call on him. It's going to help some of you. Gideon realizes that God has done something remarkable in terms of affirming Gideon's request. Gideon also realizes that is not enough. So we are given some insights into our nature. And we are given some insights into the nature of God. We are being taught now how that God is very patient with his people. We're being taught how that God's mercies are so broad that the child of God can be deeply flawed and deeply broken and deeply limited and that there is no circumstance in the life of the child of God where he can come to God with a petition and God says, I can't do it. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? See, what Gideon is doing, child of God, and, and I may assert it just as it truly is, this is a work of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God didn't let him go. It didn't let Gideon uh, move out on a half-finished work in his soul so that Gideon would still be prevaricating or struggling with his assignment out there in the field. Gideon is not going to move until he gets full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. Are you hearing me? I love this. See, I heard the brother in the gospel say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I heard him. Did you hear him? I heard the disciples in Luke's gospel chapter 17. Lord, increase my faith. It's not that I don't believe, I do believe. I just need my faith buoyed up and strengthened for this assignment. 
All right, that's what's going on, child of God. This is why not many people are called to this battle. This is not my, why many people are doing the exploits that the Lord would have them to do. Because to be honored, like Gideon is being honored, you have to be humbled. And people don't want to be that humble. I'm sorry, we don't want to be that humble. But that is the organizing principle. The fear of the Lord will grant you success. And before honor, there must be the pathway down. Am I making some sense? So Gideon has shown us how to lay hold of God and not let him go. Is that good or what? No, no. Remember the parable, uh, the account where Jesus is healing the man that was blind and he did one portion of the healing and the man's eyes were open and all he saw was trees. You guys remember that? Now, this is, again, integrated principle, integrated thinking, because Jesus could have healed that man by one act. He did it many times, didn't he? He opened the eyes of many by one act. He also could have did it by just speaking the word. But he engaged that man in the act of faith by laying his hands on him, by spitting on his eyes, and then doing it in two parts, did he not? Because he wanted truth out of that man. What do you see? That man says, I see men like trees. In other words, it's getting clear, but it's not quite clear, Lord. And the Lord acted again, and he saw clearly. And that's how you and I are. This is more about a relationship between us and Christ. Am I making some sense? It's never about the power of God. It's never about the wisdom of God. It's never about God not knowing enough. It's all about him taking you on a journey with him demanding that you cooperate with him it's all about humbling you i'm not through we're just tapping into this so we look at verse 39 this way verse 39 says and gideon said unto god let not your anger be hot against me what does gideon sound like he sounds like abraham does he not when abraham is is is, is yielding the same request for lot right he sounds like lots of god's servants who recognize that when you are asking God for something and you're pushing the envelope, the goal is to secure the relationship by affirming that you're not being irreverent with God. Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a bunch of religious folk who you can hear in their prayers, they don't have sufficient reverence for God. I hear it everywhere in religion. I hear it everywhere in religion, like dog, uh, God is some kind of lap dog or some kind of uh, 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 genie in a bottle that you use the right words and you can make God do whatever you want to do. How arrogant. That's why he doesn't show up in those people's lives. He doesn't show up. That's called playing religion. When you come to God, you must come humbly and reverently. And according to his own imperative, this is how you come. Are you ready? God says you come consistently. That is a divine imperative. You are to ask and not one time. Who are you? Who are you? All right, Lord, I asked you yesterday. Well, ask him again. Well, Lord, I've been asking you for three months. Ask him for four months. I've been asking for five years. Ask him for six years. If you actually believe the thing you are asking for is according to God's will. Am I making some sense? Now, you could be a fool like a lot of religious folk are telling God what to do. Am I teaching today? You can actually fabricate a mythical fantasy and assume that that's God's will for your life. And now you're telling God, you got to do it for me, God. And God then already went about his business and left you in the dust. <laughs> this is James chapter 4. You know it. You have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you do not receive because you're asking to consume it upon your own lust. You strive, you fight, you war because you want to do it your way. That's, that's called the carnality of free will. That is Marxist socialism. That is the devil saying, I will be like the most high God. You're just going to employ your volition and do what you want to do and then tag it saying that God gave it to me. Now, be, be careful, child of God. Are y'all with me? Be very careful. Be care very careful because God will give you what you want. But he won't be giving you what you want, what he wants. And that's a bad day when you get what you want. All right, so here Gideon is doing something that we're going to learn as I wrap it up in the gospel. 
that has to do with Gideon wanting to be sure that God's will will be executed through him as God promised. Verse 39. And Gideon said unto God, let not your anger be hot against me, and I will speak but one, this once. Let me prove, I pray thee. Do you see it? Right. So we already know the Bible says, God says do that. Ask me. Try me. Test me. I, is God bad or what? Ask me. Try me. Test me. Come on, child of God. See, the problem is with you and me, not with God. God told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, is there anything too hard for the Lord? God can do all things, can he not? Whatever he wants to do, he can do. He can do it before you ask it. He can do it above what you ask. Beyond what you think and imagine, he can. The issue is not can he, the issue is will he. Now, a lot of times the will is also answered and so the problem is not in the willing because we know that God is willing to use Gideon to win this battle. The issue is not, is God willing to do it? The issue is, is Gideon sufficiently adorned with a necessary assurance to be able to move out in obedience to God? Now, this is about 2 Corinthians 6, 1 again. We then as workers together with him, okay? We then as workers together with him beseech you, that you receive not the grace of God. What? Now, this was our New Year's verse before COVID. You guys do remember that. We then, as workers, what's the word? Integration. Integration. We have to get it. God works through his people. But when he's working through you, he's working with you. Not around you. Not above you, not under you, but through you. Watch this. Pastor, what are you talking about? Relationship. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when God is working in you to use you, he's working in you for a relationship with him that is based upon truth and reality. Gideon is working out his own foibles, his own idiosyncratic ways, his own foolishness, his own weakness, his own human dispositions, predispositions, predilections, and bents. Anybody keeping up with me? See, see, again, I'm going to tell you, when we're talking Romans chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know, that's assurance, that you might know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a call to a relationship with God. It's a struggle for the transformation of our heart and mind. Old data out, new data in. It's humbling. Because you and I are obligated to find the data. And then say, oh Lord, this, this data, no good. Take it out. Replace it with something better. I will never act right. Under these circumstances, if you don't take this program out and put in another program, am I making sense? I will always do the same thing the same way every time if God does not actually take it out and put something else in there. Renew me after him who is created in true righteousness and holiness. It's a longing for God to equip you. Thank you, Gideon. Thank you, Gideon. I'm with you, bro. I got you. I'm not as humble as you, but I understand. Lord, speak to your people. Here it is. Let me prove you, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Now, hi, now you didn't you didn't let the you didn't let the water land on the fleece and didn't land on the grass. Good deal, Lord. Good deal. Can we reverse this thing? Can, can, we, can we reverse it, Lord? I just, want to do, I just want to do a little bit of reverse engineering here just to make sure I got it. Now, this is really interesting. I shouldn't even do this as a parenthetical, but I will for those of you who, who tolerate PJ. This is called getting an understanding. Remember what I told you, understanding something is the ability to take it apart and put it back together again. Take it apart and put it back together. Remember, I told you that a child can take anything apart. That's what they do. Haven't you figured that out with your kids? They'll take it all apart. Doorknobs, 
handles, dishes. They'll take it all apart because they got potential. But they don't have wisdom to put it back together again. And this is what we would carry out as a larger sort of uh, sociological phenomenon with Marxism. It loves to tear things apart. But it can't put it back together again. You and I are dealing with a bunch of megalomaniac children who are slow. The people that help this world run right and efficiently are men and women who have understanding. They can take it apart and they can put it back together again. They can take it apart and they can put it back together again. That's called biblically wisdom. Are you guys hearing me? And, 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 and Gideon wants the wisdom. And so what I told you, when Gideon was endowed with the spirit of God here, he wasn't endowed to go around uh, making a boast in himself. He wasn't endowed by the spirit of God to just make a bunch of flailing noise and get the guys all roused up to go to battle. He was endowed with the spirit of God that he might acquire wisdom and understanding how to organize men, how to prepare men, how to position them, how to fight. How to win. This is what you and I are going to see in the next separation principle in chapter 7, are we not? So he's being given wisdom. And it's starting with an analogy. I've got a few more minutes. I'll be able to put this forth clearly. The analogy is him using an object lesson in his um, engaging God to give him an assurance of faith. The analogy here has inherent in it the gospel that I want you to see today. Because the gospel of the grace of God in Christ is the only way you and I can obtain assurance that what God has said he would do, he will do. Did you guys understand what I just said? So you pray with date, the psalmist, open thou my eyes that I may behold wonderful things out of your law. Because right now what's in front of me, Lord, is a parable. And I want the interpretation of the parable. I don't want you to just be doing tricks with fleeces. Tell me what the mystery of redemption in Christ is in this account. Because that's what Gideon is really asking. Gideon is asking the question, did Christ really die for my sins? Did Christ really bear the wrath of God? Did Christ suffer on the behalf of all of his elect the outpouring of the wrath of God upon him who is called the Lamb of God? Did God absorb, did Christ absorb all my sin, past, present, and future? In the one holy, harmless, spotless Lamb of God. If he did, then I know that God will not forsake me. Am I making some sense? All right, then, so let's understand the gospel here. Gideon does reverse engineering, and upon the ground let there be dew. And notice what the text says. We can look at verse 39, uh, verse 40. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece, what? Only and there was dew on all the ground. Here's the lesson. You've got three entities here. You've got the fleece, and you have the floor. This is the context in which the request is made, is it not? You've got the fleece, and you've got the floor. That's what we are seeing back over in verse 38, uh, verse 37. Behold, I will put a fleece of wood where? On the floor. Two symbolic connotations come out of this that are easy to see for you and me to understand this is about the death, burial, and resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ. When we are dealing with fleece, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the shearing of the wool of the lamb. Are we not? And does not Isaiah 53 verse, tell, verse 7 tell us that like a sheep or a lamb before his shearers, he was dumb and opened not his mouth? Is that what your Bible says? The woolly fleece of the Lord Jesus Christ was shaved off of him to leave him naked so that he might bear the wrath of God Almighty. Does anyone know for whom he bore that wrath? 
He bore it for any and everyone that would believe on him. I can say he bore that wrath for me. All of God's elect can say that Christ died for my sin. When God poured out his wrath on Christ, it was like the dew that came down from heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 32, let's look at it right quick and hear the doctrine explicitly asserted by God himself. He lays it out in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. Here it is. Give ear, O ye heavens. Now, who dwells in heaven? God's elect do, right? We are seated in heavenly places, are we not, in Christ Jesus? Does that also mean that we have access to heavenly revelation? Are we not receiving it now? Are there not people who dwell on the earth for whom heavenly revelation, there is no access? Here it is. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. What are we talking about? We're talking about the word of God coming down from heaven. Is that the truth? Is not Jesus the bread that comes down from heaven? Is he not the living word that men and women need for salvation? And is not he the doctrine of the living God? Look at verse 2. My doctrine shall drop as the what? Now, what is he doing? He's using the metaphor of the rain as an expression of the totality of the counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is represented by first being positioned in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. What is God's word? Or rather, who is God's word? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father. What? Full of grace and truth. He came from heaven and he went back to heaven, did he not? He came from heaven to do God's will and was not the will of the living God that he should be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? Is not he the, therefore the one that came from heaven and has went back to heaven? And him going back to heaven, what did he send? The Holy Ghost. In order that the word of the living God might have resonance in our life. That we might see the glory of God in the doctrines of grace and in the doctrines of the word of God. And the glory of God is summed up in the work of Christ in the redemption of sinners in the payment for our sins, in the propitiation that assures us that our enemies will never have victory over us again. All I need is one soul to say hallelujah, amen, and amen. Here it is. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the shower upon the grass. That is a study in itself because it's giving you three, uh, three qualities of the rain, okay? The dew becomes that part of God's doctrinal truth that always render the notion of favor, of favor. The dew is always that doctrinal truth that always renders the notion of favor. When God's favor is on you, his dew is on you. Am I making some sense? All right, so I'll, I'll just make that good. This is going to be Psalm 133, verse 3. Just state it, see it for yourself. Some of you who know your Bible, you're already rejoicing with me because you know these things are true. This is why we study the Word of God very carefully here. We want to understand the interpretation of a thing, do we not? Right, because the heavens declare the glory of God, do they not? Yep, and the firmament's his handiwork. And men and women who have the eyes of faith can see the glory of God in the things that are made. Can we not? And so the word of God gives us keys as the dew. There it is of Hermon. And as the dew that does what? It descends from heaven upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord hath commanded blessing forevermore. What is the psalmist talking about? The mediatorial work of our great high priest represented in Aaron. And remember how he was anointed with oil? And according to the previous verse, it went from his head all the way down to his feet. What is that talking about? It's talking about us being in Christ, experiencing the blessing of the anointing that's on him. Go back to verse 2, because I forgot there are folk in the house that don't read their Bible. Here it is. It's like the precious ointment upon the head. So it starts on the head. 
that ran down upon Aaron's beard. Aaron is the high priest. He's Hebrew. He's going to have a beard, is he not? He is the mediator between God and his people. Who is Aaron pointing to? Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man. Might it be very clearly stated that the oil of anointing here represents the Holy Ghost, the spirit of the living God, even Aaron's beard that went all the way down to the skirt of his garment. That means it went all the way down to his feet. Now, Aaron's body is a representative of the Jewish people for whom Aaron was a mediator and type for them under Moses. But Jesus is our high priest and Jesus is our head and we are his body. And when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost, did he not send the Holy Ghost back to anoint us? From his neck all the way down his feet, do you now not experience the anointing of the Spirit of God as I am talking to you? opening your eyes to the reality that our blessing is contained in his blessing. Our blessing is contained in his blessing. Go back to the text. Thank you, Gideon. Do you know what Gideon did? Gideon took the fleece that pointed to the crucified Christ and said, God, show us your testimony of truth on the fleece. And don't bless the ground yet. Bless the fleece. Because what we know about the fleece is that all of our spiritual blessings that are rendered to us are in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. So what God does with the fleece is demonstrate that he has favor on Christ. Because Christ laid down his life and won the crown rights for all of God's favor. This will help some of you. God's blessing on you can only come to you if you're in Christ. All the blessings of God are in him. And when you are in him, then you get those blessings too. This is why Gideon did not say, bring the dew on the ground first. I'm getting ready to talk about that. Bring the dew upon the fleece first, because the fleece tells us that Jesus is the spotless lamb of God the holy, harmless, undefiled, knew no sin, did no sin. In him was no sin. He qualifies then to bear God's wrath and own the crown rights of eternal blessing for his people. Do you see it? Do you see it? Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Some of you ought to be excited about it. Because the only reason your eyes are open is because Christ bore the wrath of God, won the crown rights to save you and give you a revelation of his glory. Am I making some sense? He won the crown rights. He was stripped of his glory. He bore the wrath of God. He was made naked for your sins that you might be clothed in that woolly righteousness of Christ in order to obtain the blessings in him. I know some of you are saying that's too good to be true, but it is. It, it is. It's true. All the promises of God are yes and amen in him. And that brother knew it. Now, what about the floor? Because we find now that Gideon says, would you now do it to the floor? Would you bless the floor? Well, if you'll notice in your text, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, right? Well, where is that floor? What is that floor? The grammar makes it very clear. The floor is given to us in verse 11. Go back to verse 11. We're going all the way back to where Gideon started. Do you know where Gideon started? He started hiding in the wine press, which became a threshing floor for the treading out of the corn. That's the same word. It's called the threshing floor. Gideon said, I need you to bless this wool with an affirmation of your favor, but don't bless the floor yet. Now, after he affirmed that the priority of the blessing is rooted in the wool, now bless the floor. I am asserting that the dew represents the doctrine of blessing. Are you guys affirming that? Right, because the dew is what is necessary for all things to grow. It's necessary for all things to be refreshed and revived. Am I making sense? This is Psalm 110 verse 3 too. Don't go there yet. Notice what the text says. And his son Gideon did what? 
threshed wheat. Literally, he threshed on the floor of the wine press. Wheat in order to prepare it to save his people, to save his family. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not hard for me. I get it. The wool points to Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The threshing floor points to the place where God redeems his elect and separates them from the wicked and the righteous. The threshing floor is a critical doctrine in the scriptures. The threshing floor is right next to the wine press. And the wine press represents the wrath of God that was poured out upon the son of the living God. This is why Jesus goes into Gethsemane. He goes into Gethsemane as the lamb of God. But he also goes into Gethsemane to bear the work of threshing to separate us from our sin, separate us from the wrath of God, separate us from the curse of the law, and to separate us unto himself. We saw it in the picture. We become the wheat that he gathers into his barnery. But the only reason we're gathered in is because of the Lamb of God who bears the wrath of God in our behalf. Say amen if you got it. Say amen if you got it. And see, you and I could go at length. My time is up. We could go at length because the threshing floor is a wonderful place several times in the scripture. I'll just give you two. The first is in the days of King David when the angel of the Lord was destroying the people of God because David numbered the people in arrogance, assuming that God wins battles by numbers. And what God told him to do is you need to go by the threshing floor of your servant and offer a sacrifice in order to propitiate for the sins of the people. Do you remember that? David bought the floor from that brother. David offered a sacrifice and the plague was stopped. What is the threshing floor? It's the place where Christ pays for our sin. The next one is in the book of Ruth. Chapter 3, verse 3, where this very enigmatic instruction is given by Naomi to Ruth. Brother Boaz is in the threshing floor, sleep. Now I need you to go there late at night because we don't want any other brother or sister to see you creeping up on Boaz. Is anybody with me? Now this is Mama Naomi telling Ruth how to get a man. This would have to be totally broken down for the 21st century. Don't have time. <laughs> and what does she do? In the threshing floor, she reveals herself to Boaz. And Boaz says, I will marry you. It was right there they were engaged. Boaz rose up the next morning and immediately went to the work of looking for the kinsman redeemer, settling him, purchasing Naomi and Ruth, and Ruth was able to marry Boaz. It's in the threshing floor that you and I are married to Christ who dies for our sins and places us in him so that again, all the blessings of God are yes and amen in him. Please hear what I am doing. Please hear what I am saying. I'm saying that Gideon is not rendering some arbitrary request. His request is in Christ. His prayer is in Jesus. His desire for assurance of winning the battle is a totally gospel-centered request. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? He's asking God to reveal Christ as his substitute and surety of redemption so that when he leaves that next morning to go to the battle, he will know that the battle is already won because Christ has already died, risen, ascended on high. And he has the blessing. But now the dew is on the floor because the floor is where the people of God are. This is where you and I labor. We're in the threshing floor right now. Do you know that? Yeah, we are in the, we are in the task of separating the chaff from the wheat. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing right now in this room. Separating chaff from wheat. Separating the elect from the non-elect. Separating the rebel from God's rebel sinners. Oh, we are praying that every one of you know the grace of the living God, but it's just so that the church is a threshing floor. Let the wheat and the tare grow together 
So the gospel's preached and some of us love it and some of us go ho-hum. I'm sorry that that's the case because the preaching of the gospel is to bring assurance to us on the grounds of not who we are, but on the grounds of who he is. Did you guys get that? Got one more thing to say and I'm done. This is amazing. It's an amazing thing to me. And here's what's amazing. I'm not going to unpack the rest of this point. What's amazing to me is how that God would hear a man and set aside nature to affirm him in his salvation. How that the omnipotent, almighty God of the universe who holds everything up by the word of his power would hear the prayer of a single saint and modify nature, manipulate nature, hold it back, send it forward, increase it, stop it, let it flow. God has done that over and over and over again in the scriptures to let us know not only does he separate, but he separates because he's sovereign. Sovereign means he has all power, all authority, all dominion. And when he says to his people, just ask, whatever we ask in the name of Christ, according to his will, he will do it. He will open the Red Sea to make 1.3 million people walk across dry shot. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. Moses cried out to the Lord. The Lord said, stop crying. This day you will see the salvation of the Lord. Joshua is fighting the battles of the Lord in Joshua chapter 10. And there were a bunch of God's enemies that were just about to get away. And Joshua said, Lord, cause the sun to stand still and the moon not move until I defeat all your foes. And you know what the scripture says? The sun stood still and the moon stood still until Joshua destroyed all his foes. And here we are with a little weak man that some of us would dare to want to challenge. He simply says, God, would you for a moment intervene supernaturally in order to grant me an assurance of your faith. I could go on and on because we're going to see another one in the 13th chapter with a judge that most people don't understand. But remember what I told you? When you don't understand them, you're going to assign bad pejorative conclusions on them. But Brother Samson is one of the baddest judges in all of Israel. And he's going to call upon God and the earth is going to quake and God's going to destroy all of God's people's foes too. See, can I say something, ladies and gentlemen? The problem is not with God. It's with us. It's true. Amen. 